as well. And let me share my screen now. Okay. So, huh, how do I share my screen? <laughs> Doesn't wanna, let's try this one. Okay. Let's see if we can see the presentation. Can you perfect. see the presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, at our live stream, which is gonna be about financial aid and scholarships. My name is Hani and I am the Education USA Advisor at the Fulbright Commission in Prague. And today I've got Lucia, who is my special guest from Milwaukee School of Engineering. And she's gonna talk to us about financial aid and scholarships in general. And then she'll introduce the Milwaukee School of Engineering as well. Thank you for joining us, Lucia. Thank you. Uh, as for, let me see if I can move. Okay, as for the Education USA, for those of you who don't know us, uh, this is a great opportunity for me to introduce us. Education USA is a network that helps students uh, who are interested in studying in the United States. So the advisor, myself, I'm happy to help you free of charge uh, with the application process. So basically uh, deciding uh, which schools are the best fit for you and uh, how to apply for scholarships and how to um fill out the application and then how to apply for visa so if you guys are thinking about the united states and studying in the us please let me know and i'll be happy to help you i am located in prague in the czech republic uh, but feel free to reach out to me via email address through advisor at fulbright.cz and i'll be happy to connect with you online so you don't have to be from prague to uh be eligible for this help. What we also have are American centers that are in Uski, Plzeň, Brno, Olomouc, and Ostrava. So if you live close to these cities, you can definitely visit our advisors there and they'll be happy to help with some basic advising. And then if you need further assistance, you can definitely reach out to me. And um, our free services, apart from these live streams, are webinars as well. I visit high schools where I talk to students about their opportunities in the United States. Uh, we also have a library. So if you are just preparing for your SATs or TOEFL exams or GREs for your graduate studies, you can come and borrow a book. Uh, that will help you with your preparations and we offer consultations so if you have any questions feel free to type them underneath the live stream if you have questions not regarding financial aid and scholarship feel free to send me an email or a dm on uh, social media under education usa check and if you scan this qr code that will take you uh, to our newsletter, to a subscription to our newsletter that I put together every month and I just uh, try to add information from the US higher education system. I try to put information about scholarship opportunities. So it is a nice source of information for you if you are thinking about uh, applying to the US. Well, and now I'm going to turn it over to Lucia and uh, we are going to talk about scholarships and funding. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, so um, we'll be talking a little bit about financial aid opportunities in the United States and then funding and um, just how you can expect to pay for your education, scholarships, everything like that. Mm -hmm. So um, different types of aid we'll talk about, um, how to apply for scholarships, different, um, how to find additional funding, um, and then some scholarships that we offer at Milwaukee School of Engineering. Um, and then we'll have time at the end for questions um, if anybody has any. So, mm -hmm. so there are a couple different types of aid. Um, loans are gonna be like borrowing money from either a bank, um, sometimes you could borrow money from a specific person, but the most popular would be probably from like a bank or some sort of financial institution. Um, and typically you would borrow the money and then you'd need to pay it back um, with interest. Mm -hmm. And so make sure you pay attention to that interest rate. Some, some loans are gonna have a really high interest rate. Some are gonna have a lower one. Obviously the lower the interest rate, the better because um, it's less you have to pay in addition to what you're borrowing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are scholarships and grants. These are really 
good money that you want to, you know, look for. Scholarships are going to be free money. Um, you don't need to pay them back. They're often based on merit, um, talent, or if you maybe you're studying in a specific area. Um, it'll depend kind of on the school that you're looking at um, on how you can qualify for these scholarships. But this is going to be free money. So this is going to be a really good um good way to help pay for your education in the United States. And then grants are often um, based on need or, um, you know, like financial need, but they're also money that you don't need to pay back. Um, and so these are also going to be good, but they're not necessarily based on any sort of merit or athletic talent or anything like that. Um, typically, again, it's just based kind of on financial need. Um, typically, these come from the institution themselves. Um, there might be outside grants that you might be eligible for, um, as well as outside scholarships as well, but we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. So, um, Sponsorships are kind of unique. These we don't see quite as often. Um, they might be a little bit more common at the graduate level rather than the undergraduate level, um, but sometimes a company will sponsor you. I've seen students, um, in the rare case, maybe a, um, an undergraduate student, their parents' company might um, sponsor their their um, studies, maybe not fully, but just you know give some sort of a little bit of a sponsorship. Um, so that might be you know possible. Um, maybe it's money from a relative, something like that. But again, this also would need to be paid back. It's more kind of free money that you would get. So it's a good option. Mm -hmm. um, and then work study is money that you would earn working at a school in the U.S. The school that you're going to, you wouldn't necessarily work at a different school to get that. Uh, but the school you're attending, you'd be able to work on campus um, on the F-1 visa, which is how most students, I would say, study in the U.S. Um, you could work up to 20 hours a week. Um, and so you can't make a ton of money doing it, but it's a good way to make kind of spending cash if you want to go to the movies or if you want to you know, pay for gas or something like that. Um, so that's another option. And then a, another one that's not listed here might be um, residential advising. So that's another good option for students. It's basically, you would be kind of like the, the, the person in charge of a whole floor in one of the residence halls. And you'd be, you know, answering any questions that the students who live on that floor have. You'd be putting any sort of maintenance request in. You'd be holding different events to kind of bring the, the floor together and build community. Mm -hmm. um, in exchange for all of those, you would have free room and board. So all of your housing and your meal plan would all be um, paid for in kind of payment for being in that position. You do have to interview for it. Sometimes it's pretty competitive, but um, it's a really good option to, to cut your costs a, a good amount. So. That is a very good deal. And my question would be, can even international students, freshman international students apply for this position? So typically you have to be at school for at least a year before you could be hired as a residential advisor or residential assistant. Um, Cause you need to know a little bit about the university. You need to be a, a bit established, mm -hmm. um, but it's a great option for like sophomore, juniors or seniors. Um, international go. students are certainly eligible for it at that level, but not the freshman level, unfortunately. And guys, for those of you who are watching, I do have personal experience with work study. Those jobs, I personally worked at the business office, but I also know that many international students worked in a school canteen or in a library, in a gym, so or in a mail office, you know, where you just receive mail and hand it out to students. So it is not some fancy fancy job, but you know, it was great enough. And as as Lucia said, I like I earned money to spend, you know, on my coffee and stuff. So that was really nice. I and the connection that I made through that job because in the business office I met with uh ladies and they were so nice and they helped out and you know the 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 relationship that I established were very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that. So um, there's institutional aid, which would come from the school that you're attending. Um, so that's typically going to be a scholarship, maybe a grant. Um, typically, loans wouldn't come from the U.S. school just because they don't handle any of that. Um, and they wouldn't necessarily come from a U.S. bank because you would need a co-signer in the U.S. to get a loan from a U.S. bank. 
Um, but it is an option if you know somebody in the US who would co-sign for you, that'd be an option. But typically students who are taking out loans would come, the loan would come from their home country. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of all the, the aid that would come from an institution. Unfortunately, as a international student, you would not be eligible for any need-based aid from the United States, like a domestic student would. Um, but you can see, you know, if there's any sort of need-based aid in your country, which you could certainly look into. Um, I'm by no means an expert on the individual countries around the world and what kind of aid they give out, but definitely look into that. Yeah, guys. Yeah, so go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So we are looking into what the school can offer, but for the students from the Czech Republic, guys, there are plenty of foundations that can help you mentioning Bakala Foundation, Kellner Family Foundation, Grasek Family Foundation. So please uh, let me know and I'll be happy to show you the entire list. There is a special funding opportunity for students who come from Olomouc region. Like I personally use this one. So uh, there is plenty you can use. Just let me know. I'll be happy to uh, show you or kind of like point you to the good resources. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yeah. So then this is gonna be important as well to learn how to apply for scholarships. Um, these are gonna be the best way I would say. It's all free money, so it's really good. The more scholarships you can get, the better. Um, mm -hmm. Some scholarships will be renewing each year. Sometimes they'll be just for one academic year. You just kind of look at each specific scholarship you might be applying for to see if it's renewable or just a one-year thing. Mm -hmm. um, but some institutions you're automatically be awarded some sort of merit scholarship upon acceptance. Um, most institutions I would say will have some sort of merit scholarship upon acceptance to bring that cost down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but some schools will also have additional scholarships you can apply for. Um, at Milwaukee School of Engineering, the school that I represent, we have one um, additional scholarship form that you fill out and it has all the information on it. It has your um, your grades from your high school, what um, degree you're looking to seek, and um, any sort of extracurricular activities you participated in. It just has a lot of different information about you on it. Um, and then we use that one form to see if you qualify for any additional scholarships that come up throughout the year. And so if you, if you qualify for any of those scholarships, we automatically put your name in the running for that scholarship. Um, sometimes we might need an extra essay from you or something like that, but typically we just put your name right in. Um, and it's just one general form, which is really nice. Other schools might have multiple. You might have to keep looking at their website to see if there's new scholarships posted. Um, it just really, just really depends. So just look into that and see how the school you're looking at, um, how they handle scholarships and additional scholarships um, in their school. So make sure that you research institutions to see what kind of aid they offer to students, whether it's need-based, need-blind, need-aware, and merit-based, which we'll talk a little bit um, more on the, on the next slide. So need-based aid is awarded um, based on a student's ability to pay for college. So somebody who um, has been determined that they can pay up to $40,000 per year is going to get less need-based aid than a student who has been determined they can pay $10,000 per year. Um, so need-based aid is really just varies based on your, your family's financial situation. Um, and so this is going to be just kind of supplementary aid. And so does the Milwaukee School of Engineering do students uh, apply through CSS profile or is there something else? So we we unfortunately don't offer any need-based aid, but I know other schools in the United States do. And so, yeah, so that, um, not too familiar with the CSS, mm -hmm. C, um, but I, I know I've seen it, the Common App, I think. Uh -huh. um, so I know yeah. that that you know it has all the information about it um, about your financial situation. So definitely, if the school that you're looking at does offer need-based aid, I'm pretty confident they would they would um, accept that specific form, or they might have a specific form you fill out. But just kind of look into that. Mm -hmm. And then need-blind scholarships um, or aid is going to does not take into account any of the you know applicants' ability to pay for college. It's just looking at extracurricular activities, community involvement, any sort of clubs you might be involved in, 
um, sports, anything like that. So that's going to not really have anything to do with your financial need. It's just going to be um, what you qualify for, for like stuff you've participated in and that sort of thing. And then need aware, it, it takes into account, um, you know, students' expenses. So they might, you know, it, merit scholarships are going to be need aware. So we are aware of kind of the need that you might need, the financial need you might require. Um, but it's also kind of like a standardized scholarship. So if that makes sense. Um, and then merit based is going to be based on like academic success. So it's going to be like athletic scholarships, it's going to be uh, merit based on your high school um, scores, SAT scores, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a sliding scale. So it might be um, if you have a 3.0 grade point average, you might get a different merit scholarship than somebody who has a 4.0. So the better your grades, the higher the scholarship. Um, athletic, schol athletic scholarships are only available at division one schools. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you have to be like recruited for those. Um, it's a very specific group of, of colleges in the United States that offer those athletic scholarships. You can certainly play sports at other schools that are not designated as um, division one, but we you're not allowed to get any sort of athletic scholarship for um, participating in athletics at any other level in the US. So that's kind of a different to kind of keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So again, like check to make sure that the scholarships you're applying for, see if they're renewable um, or if they're just a one-year thing. Typically merit scholarships or athletic scholarships are gonna be every year that you're in attendance. Um, but then there's other kind of extra scholarships you might apply for that might just be for one year. So just look into that when you're looking at how much it would cost you to attend a specific school, factor in if the scholarships you're receiving are renewable or just, um, just a one-year thing. And then again, the size of uh, and type of institution will also determine availability of aid. Um, so smaller schools might have a higher tuition, so their merit scholarships might be a little higher, and they might not offer any sort of need-based aid because their budget might be a bit smaller than a larger institution. Um, and so that can really, you know, make a difference in what kind of aid they have available, as well as private schools versus public schools. So private schools tend to be a little bit smaller. Um, so their aid might be, it might cost a little bit more to go to those schools, um, mm -hmm. but public schools might have a lower tuition, but their scholarships might be a, little, a bit lower as well because they mm -hmm. don't need to discount that, that tuition quite as much. Mm -hmm. um, so this, um, the competitiveness of, of getting certain scholarships um, smaller schools have a smaller population, obviously, and so the 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 like chances of getting a additional scholarship might be a little bit higher because there's not quite as many students applying for it. So if you go to a school that has only maybe three thousand students in attendance, um, then maybe you're only competing against maybe two hundred other students, maybe even less. Um, for maybe an additional scholarship. If you go to a bigger school, there's gonna be a larger population of students applying for that scholarship. So it might be a bit more competitive to get it. So there might be more scholarships available, mm -hmm. but the chances of getting them might be a little lower, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, so, and then the different kinds of aid is gonna depend on the, the type of institution as well. Like I said, Milwaukee School of Engineering doesn't offer any need-based aid, but other schools certainly would. So some schools will have fully funded scholarships available, other schools will not. So it just really varies based on the school. There's not really any sort of standard practice in the United States um, in terms of scholarships or, or aid available. Mm -hmm. And then um, there are, you know, loans that you can certainly take out. I know we've discussed this a little bit as well. Um, from your home country, if you have a co-signer in the United States, you can have a loan um, in the United States as well. So that's another option. Um, and so look at kind of the cost of attendance compared to the available aid. Like I said, private schools are going to have a bit of a higher tuition. 
um, then, then public schools will have a bit of a lower tuition, but the aid available at each might really vary drastically. So you wanna make sure you don't just look at the cost of tuition, you wanna see what the discounts available for scholarships and grants are available um, to really see what the, the accurate cost of attendance is gonna be. Um, some schools will require you to live on campus, so that increases the cost of attending um, versus living off campus. So there's just a lot of things to take into account and factor in. Mm -hmm. So then there are some external resources that I'd like to share as well. Um, some examples are internationalscholarships.com, IEFA, which I don't know what that stands for, but it's IEFA.com is the website that we refer students to. Um, and then NASA also has some scholarships available as well for international students. Um, so just make sure that you're utilizing any sort of external resource. Um, so use your admissions counselor at each school that you're looking at to make sure that if they have any additional scholarships or any sort of additional aid that they might be aware of, um, use all your resources available. Don't just kind of, you can certainly do your own research, but make sure you're asking the people who do this for a living, you know, admissions counselors, financial aid officers, um, they have the, the biggest access and the, the, the widest knowledge on external resources. So use them, look into everything possible um, to try to get that education as cheap as you can in the US, because it can definitely be costly, but, um, there are a lot of resources out there to help you bring down that cost as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then um, getting a, a job on campus, again, it likely won't pay for all of your, you know, cost of attending a U.S. school, but it can certainly help bring that cost down a bit. Um, so as soon as you attend school or, you know, enroll, typically there'll be some sort of college career fair or a job fair, on-campus job fair, anything like that. Um, so the earlier you can get an on-campus job, the better, because the, the longer you can work it, obviously, then. Um, and so you can work anywhere between, you could really work an hour a week if you wanted, but most students will work between 10 and, and 20 hours per week, because it's a good balance between working on their studies and then working, you know, um, on campus as well. So make sure that studies come first, um, that you're academically successful, but then, you um, you can certainly kind of get a break with working on campus and then earn a little bit of money as well. Mm -hmm. um, again, like Hani said, they're not, you're not getting $100,000 working on campus, but um, certainly it's a good way to kind of offset the day-to-day the -day costs, like going out to eat or maybe getting some groceries or gas or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. And then another way, a great way to, to kind of offset the cost as well is getting an internship. Um, there are lots and lots of internships available, um, especially if you're looking at in the STEM field, but even outside of that, it's psychology, sociology, English, anything like that. There's gonna be internships available. Um, so make sure you look into that and see kind of what options are available at the schools you're looking at, um, how they can help students get internships, what kind of connections they have with companies. Um, because I know our students at Milwaukee School of Engineering, they can make anywhere from like five to $13,000 just over the summer working at an internship. So they're getting really paid quite well. Um, and they're working full time over the summer at these internships. And, you know, $13,000 can go a long way in helping pay your tuition for the next year. So, and guys, um, we just had a webinar or a live stream just a week ago uh, about CPT, OPT, and STEM extension. It's in Czech. I actually had it with a Czech student who is currently studying in the US and she went through the CPT. Now she's going through OPT and she, because she studied architecture, she is now going to apply for the STEM extension for another two years. So uh, have a look, it's available on social media and she is explaining it in Czech. What is a CPT? What is an OPT? How to apply for it? She's talking about internships in general and she is in your shoes. So she knows what she's talking about. She has been through that. So have a look, it's like half an hour. And I think it has all the information that you might be looking for. Perfect, yeah, definitely check that out because that's gonna be a really good thing to look at. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the advantages to going to school in the US is you know being able to work in the US for a little bit. So definitely mm -hmm. check that out. Mm -hmm. 
So then um, there is an international student financial aid application. You know, it's a form that some schools will use to determine need-based eligibility for a student. Mm -hmm. um, the I see, see, there it is, CSS, um, College Scholarship Service, the Common App, I believe it's through. Um, there's, you know, a lot of different forms that you might be able to fill out um, at certain schools that do offer need-based aid. Mm -hmm. um, and so just look into that um, and certainly apply for that if the school offers it. And guys, I remember we are mostly filling out the CSS profile through College Board website. Sometimes you're asking me about FAFSA, but FAFSA is not for international students. Just be aware of that. That's not uh, something that you can take advantage of. So maybe have a look at ESFAA, but uh, we are mostly working with the CSS profile. Yeah. Yeah, so again, some schools um, will, you know, have their own form, will not accept that, you know, CSS or the ISFFA or FFA. Um, so just check with your admissions counselor at the school you're looking at to see um, what specific form they use to make sure you're turning the right one in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then make sure you know your financial ability. Um, you know, know the cost of tuition, the cost of living expenses, how much the meal plan is, health insurance. Um, make sure you have like a, a, a big picture of how much it will cost and then subtract whatever scholarships or grants or aid that they have available at that school so you can really get a good idea of how much exactly it will cost. Um, mm -hmm. You only need to show proof of funds for one year, um, but obviously make sure that you have funds to pay for the other three years um, or at least have a plan of how you're going to pay for those other three years because there would be nothing more disappointing than going to school and then not being able to finish your degree because of, of a financial situation. So um, okay, guys, if you are looking into like the total amount of money that you will have to pay, I usually advise students to put the name of the school and then cost of attendance. And that way it will it should show you the entire amount of money that you will have to pay. So what you're searching for is called cost of attendance and the name of the school. So that way you will get the, uh, the whole picture because sometimes the prices only show the tuition and then there are other, and there is other price for room and board and other price for insurance and then books, like don't forget about books, you know? So uh, just make sure that you're really counting everything. And uh, as Lucia said, make sure that uh, you're just not, showing that you have the money for the first year because I know the students are like it will we will figure it out somehow and then guess what you know sometimes they don't and sometimes you know they're then reaching out to me and they're like you know what should I do I am here and I am loving it and I just don't have the money and I don't have this magic stick just to say here it is you know so make yeah. sure that you plan ahead planning is a big key here mm -hmm. certainly yes so there's other things to keep in mind, health insurance that is mandatory for international students. Um, you don't have to purchase the health insurance from the school you're attending, but you do need health insurance, whether it's from home um, or if you do purchase it from the school you're attending, you definitely need that. So factor that in. If you're living off campus, what's the cost of living? Um, depending on where the school is in the United States, the cost of living will vary dramatically. Some schools are located you know, in a more rural environment. So living off campus would be a lot less expensive than living in, you know, New York City or Chicago or like a really big urban city. Um, if you have a, you know, public transportation, how much that will be, food, if you're living off campus, groceries, um, anything like that. So just kind of try to anticipate any sort of extra cost you might have. Again, your admissions counselor will be a good resource for that because they can give you a good, a good estimate of, of how much living off campus would be, how much transportation, um, extracurriculars, that sort of thing, how much it would be for, for the school you're looking at. Yeah, and I also found out that there is this great website called Numbeo website that can compare your current city that you're in. So for, in my instance, I come from HEP. So I would put HEP and then when I am accepted to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, I would I could compare what is the rent in HEP and what is the rent in Bethlehem and what is the dinner in a restaurant in HEP and what is the dinner in a restaurant in Bethlehem. And it actually has 
different states, different cities in the US and different states and different cities in the Czech Republic. It's called Numbeo, again, numbeo.com. And you can easily compare these, as Lucia said, like the basics that you need to know, how much is a grocery, how much is a beer, you know, like those mm -hmm. basic things so that you can imagine how much more most of mostly mostly uh, it will be for you and you can kind of do your uh, money uh, prioritizing and uh, just to figure it out yeah yeah that's a great resource I didn't know about so that's awesome <laughs> yeah okay so I'll talk a little bit about the school that I represent now Milwaukee School of Engineering mm -hmm. um, so we um, are a smaller private school we have uh, just under 3,000 students enrolled um, in our undergraduate and graduate programs together. Mm -hmm. um, and so definitely a smaller school. We have about 100 international students this um, currently enrolled in undergraduate and graduate programs. Um, that's a little bit of a low number for us just because we're kind of coming, coming off of COVID and um, having a little bit lower international student enrollment. Mm -hmm. uh, but this past fall, we had over 40 students start. Um, so that number is certainly going to go up every year now, um, I anticipate. We have over 30 countries represented. We have students from Nigeria, from China. Um, we have German students. We have a couple of Czech students who are um, studying abroad here. And mm -hmm. then I think we have two, two Czech students who are studying here on an F-1 visa like all four years. So that's kind of cool. Um, so students from all over the world. And then we have international faculty as well. So we have um, a German uh, math teacher. We have uh, a computer science faculty member from India. Um, so we have faculty from all over as well. Mm -hmm. And then we're a university that's really focused on the practical application of what's learned in the classroom. Um, so we're very STEM focused. We have a lot of um, engineering programs. We have nursing, actuarial science. Um, so we, we're very hands-on applications based. Um, so you'll spend time, a lot of time doing labs and doing a lot of um, different experiments and different projects outside of your lecture. Um, and so we really want you to put to use what kind of the theory, but then put it to use and actually like get your hands dirty and, and really build things and, and tinker with little toys and so that sort of thing. So very cool. So we are a direct entry institution. Um, and so what that means is that we don't have any sort of pre-engineering, pre-nursing, um, anything like that. So you would start taking your mechanical engineering classes, your biomedical engineering classes right away um, from day one. And so you would just jump right in and see, you know, is this a good fit for me? If not, you would just switch, you could switch majors anytime in your first or second year. Um, something that maybe interests you a little bit more and then you'll spend a lot of time in labs like i said over 600 hours of, of time in labs throughout your four years of study um, and so mostly every class outside of like math or um, english or any of your kind of general elective classes you're going to have a lab associated with all your other classes like physics and all your engineering classes and nursing and everything like that mm -hmm. And then in your last year, um, some, for some programs, it's in your third year. Most of the programs are in your, your final senior year. Um, you'll spend the whole year working on a senior design project. And so what that project is, sometimes it's assigned to you. Sometimes um, you pair up with the local company. Sometimes it's your own kind of personal project that you've been wanting to work on. It really varies based on your major, um, but you'll spend that whole year working on it from inception all the way through to maybe a 3D model or presenting to the specific company. Um, it just really varies, but it's a good way, kind of a last step um, that it really mimics the kind of projects you'll be working on in the real world and in industry. Um, and so it's kind of a, a, a nice, kind of ease into it because you still have the mentorship of your faculty. You have um, other students to lean on because it's a group project. Um, and so it's it's just a nice way to kind of ease into the, the workforce, um, but still get that experience and and kind of, uh, and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. we have very small- safe. Sorry, I always felt like doing these kind of project, I felt very safe to make mistakes. That it was yes. a place to mm -hmm. learn for us when I'm, you know, at the real job 
it mm -hmm. like you can still make mistakes but they have consequences here they're just gonna tell you you know you don't do this this way so right. this is amazing that you can practice in this way 600 hours you know of life through the four years that's amazing like mm -hmm. because you end up not only with a piece of paper that you have the bachelor degree but you also have so much practical you know experience that's great yeah mm -hmm. and then we have really small class sizes because we're a smaller school so our student to professor ratio is about 13 to 1 um, and so what that means like in regular terms is that you're your biggest classes will be the intro classes like calculus, physics, um, English. Those are the classes that everyone's going to take no matter what their major is. Mm -hmm. um, and so those will be maybe 30, 35 students in a class. Um, but then as you keep going and you get a lot more specific, maybe in your, um, your major specific courses might be smaller and have mm -hmm. maybe 10 to 15 students in them. Um, we don't have any teaching assistants here. So it's it's all professors teaching your classes, professors teaching and leading all your labs. Um, so you really get to know your professors on, you know, a really good, you know, uh, personal basis, I would say. If they, if they don't see you in class one day, they're gonna reach out and say, is everything okay? You know, if you end up getting the flu and you have to miss class, they're gonna be really flexible in letting you turn in assignments late. Um, Cause they, they know you, they know the kind of student you are. Um, so it's just, it's kind of an advantage I see um, having that, that smaller class sizes and the, mm -hmm. the professor interaction. Mm -hmm. and then we do have a four-year graduation guarantee. Um, and so what that means is that as long as you stay on track, you take the classes we tell you to, you pass everything the first time, um, we can guarantee that you'll graduate with your bachelor's degree in four years. Um, so if you need to get into a specific class because it's on your track, um, and it's full, we'll make sure you can get in or we'll open another section to, to accommodate more students. Um, but we're not gonna make you take, you know, like wait a whole year or another semester to take it. We'll make sure that you can take it at the appropriate time. And my question is so that for every international student, there is a person who is gonna tell you like, this is the courses that you should take in the first year. And if you follow my advice, you can graduate in four years, right? How do you yes. call this person? academic advisor okay great yep so you'll have an academic advisor that will you know advise you on what classes to take and if you're interested in a specific kind of subset within your major they'll um, help you pick the right electives to kind of pursue that specialty um, but then there's an international student advisor as well and that person um, will help you with any sort of um CPT question, or if you have any questions about your visa, going back home for the holidays, anything that's kind of outside the academics, um, where to get German food in Milwaukee, that sort of thing. Um, she'll help with everything outside of academics. And so you'll have kind of two advisors that you'll mostly work with. Nice. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about cost information, um, tuition and fees um, is $46,506. And then um, tuition, the living cost, so that's gonna be room, um, living on campus as well as your meal plan is just under $13,000. Mm -hmm. um, and then health insurance is $2,075. So that brings the total cost up to $61,446, but Every accepted international student will receive a scholarship. This is merit-based. Um, so everybody, as soon as you're accepted, um, gets that blanket $25,000 per year. So that brings the cost down to right around $36,000 um, without having to apply for any other scholarships or anything like that. That just is an automatic discount that every student will get. Um, and then there's additional scholarships that if you um, participated in any sort of engineering club, robotics club, um, anything like that you would be eligible for. Mm -hmm. And that does not require an additional application, but you just need to make your admissions counselor aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. So there are some additional scholarships as well um, that are donor funded. So I mentioned a little earlier, there's a general scholarship application that you would fill out. It has all your information on it. Um, and this would allow you to be considered for any additional scholarships that are donor funded um, mm -hmm. without having to apply for each of them individually. And then there are other private scholarships um, outside of the school. 
that you can apply for as well that have their own application. So that could help bring your cost down even more. Mm -hmm. So the admissions requirements are gonna be um, a 3.0 grade point average um, in high school. If you're currently in your senior year or your final year, um, we just need to see all the way up until that. We don't need to see all of your schooling quite yet. We'll just need it um, once you're enrolled, but we just need to see all of your schooling up until now. Mm -hmm. um, the last four, three or four years, I'd say, not like down to when you're five years old or anything like that, but um, just your high school years, I'd say. Um, and then for our business and construction management program, it's a little bit lower of a requirement at 2.8. Mm -hmm. um, and this is on a 4.0 scale, which is like the US scale here. Mm -hmm. um, we need to see proof of English proficiency, which is a TOEFL or an IELTS. We do accept the Duolingo as well. Um, but the TOEFL, we need to see an 82, and IELTS, we need to see a 6.5. Mm -hmm. um, and then we don't require any sort of standardized exam like the SAT or the ACT, but we do recommend it. Um, we find that it really helps with getting your visa approved. Um, it shows us even more proof that you're academically prepared as well. Um, and then we need to see, because all of our programs are very um, math and science heavy, I would say, like STEM, um, we need to see a really strong math and science background to make sure that you're prepared as well. And then um, once you're accepted, you've decided you wanna to come to Milwaukee School of Engineering, we would just need to see an official financial guarantee and then a copy of your passport. This is the two documents we need to issue your I-20 um, and make sure that you can afford to attend MSOE. Um, and I would probably have a question because I can imagine students asking me, what is a strong math and science background and how to demonstrate that? Yeah, great question. So um, we wanna see that you've taken um, higher level math courses. So mm -hmm. for, for international students, it can, the, the name of that, those courses can really vary. Sometimes it just says like high school math and that's not specific at all. Um, but we'll sometimes ask to see a syllabus to see if you've taken like the equivalent of like a pre-calculus content, calculus. Mm -hmm. um, we wanna see like higher than algebra and trigonometry. Mm -hmm. And then science, we want to see that you've taken, you know, four years of, of science, whether it's physics, chemistry, biology. Um, we want to see that you've really chosen to take those um, higher level math classes and, and enrolled in science classes over maybe like an extra art class or extra, you know, um, gym or physical education class. We want to see that you've taken extra classes in that in that way to really strengthen your your math and science um kind of knowledge in that way good so for you guys uh it might be especially i was at a gymnasium and i'm gonna talk mm -hmm. a little check but i was at a gymnasium and we had the opportunity to have seminars so the seminars could be considered as a stronger background in math. So seminars, mathematiki, nebo seminars, uh, biology. That's exactly what Lucia is talking about. And maybe if we take it even a step further, that can be an AP class, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you have some spare time and you are passionate about science and math, you can have a look at Centrum Pro Talentovanou Mladež in Prague, and they have some AP classes that you can take and you will receive a certificate that can then demonstrate this strong background in these two. Mm -hmm. We do accept students conditionally as well who are maybe proficient in everything else, like academically prepared, mm -hmm. but not um, proficient in English. We do partner with a English school in um, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you, if you need extra help with English, we can certainly um, accept you conditionally as long as you attend that school. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can be fully admitted to MSOE as well. Nice. Mm -hmm. Um, our application is free on our website, so that's it right there, msoe.edu backslash apply. Um, so it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to complete, so it's super easy, and then you'll be paired up with a admissions counselor here, and they'll walk you through everything else um, through the admissions process. So you don't use the Common App? We do have Common App as well. So we do accept Common App, and then we have an application on our website as well. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Great. So. All right, well, I'll leave this open for questions and answers now, or questions, I'd say, oh, hopefully I have the answers. 
Uh, as this is a live stream, if there are any questions, they'll be probably written underneath. So I don't think that uh, I don't see any right now. So maybe okay. when students watch it, then they'll have questions later. And I'll be happy if I can find an answer to forward them to you. Uh, so thank you so much, Lucia. Uh, let me just see, do you have any contact information here on you? You know, I think we forgot to add that slide on so that. <laughs> Okay, let me see because I might have it in my um, in my presentation as a last slide. So I just wanted to show students that if they have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me as I showed my email address. If you have questions for Lucia or for MSOE in general, check out their website and or email me and I'll be happy to connect you with Lucia uh, myself. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you for taking us. Uh, to Milwaukee School of Engineering, but most of all, taking uh, thank you for explaining the financial aid and scholarships, internship opportunities. That was amazing. So thank you. Yeah. And let me stop the live stream. And.